Yeah, Tom can, Tom can go first. Yes, I can no, no, go I got first it. this time. Welcome yeah. to the Cult of Tom Ritchie podcast for the Age of Reason. Oh my god. You like the new background? Oh my god. Yeah, I do. <laughs> new upgraded background. <laughs> oh my god. Where'd you get that picture of me? It was a video of you tagged from like Jake or Luke's Instagram or whatever. And I just I'm, I'm a, was able to I'm get a good off. screen. I'm lucky you could go. I have two hands. I do have two hands. No, no. You don't have any hands. Oh, yeah. Okay, fair. Yeah, but I'll never give a fire. So your legs okay. got chopped and burned off by the fire as well. <sighs> it's so bad. Matt, are you going? able to see the new background <clears throat> for the podcast? Uh, I don't think so. Go check I don't it know out. how to do it. Don't, it it's, it's pretty good. But you know what else is pretty good? The Age of Reason? Yes. The Age Transition. of Reason is a very enlightening time, as you could say. Would you like to Would you like to tell us about it, Tom? Not really, but... All right, I got it. Oh, no, yeah. shut up. Tom's yeah. got it. Tom, 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 Tom's got it. Tom. You're a mad. Okay. Right. So, All right, I'll go back to my Pop-Tart bites. Go, go back to your Pop-Tart yeah, bites. Good night. Unless you're going to look at the new background, we don't want to hear Matt's, all right? All, all right, right, I'll so just be background commentary. Background commentary for today. So, Brownie, since Brownie missed out, he's going to be doing majority of the reading this time. Here, well, talk yeah, about. even though I'm still sick, theoretically. All According right. to the doctor, I'm still sick, but I'm going to give very reading. So, let's get into this enlightenment, right? So, this is the beginning of the time where they started applying scientific method to political, social, economic, and, like, religious institutions. They are like... Let's try and use the scientific method to figure out what's the correct way to run our society, right? So it was a, a way for them to rationally question all these prevailing institutions or patterns of current thought. And this brought to a general belief in society that human progress was much more possible. And all these old ideas like feudalism and the ancient regime were being questioned. So... Developments of this enlightenment did not go unchallenged, of course. So anyone who held feudal, despotic, or, you know, religious power would set restrictions on the enlightened thinkers. And especially people such as the clerics in particular, they remained bulwarks of, you know, the old ways of thought, not wanting these, you know, enlightenment thinkers to take away their power. So this brings on how did the actually come to these, you know, enlightened thoughts and conclusions, and that was through a rational and empirical thought. Go, Brownie. Check. I think I'm sick. I'm going to talk about it, because <laughs> that's how enlightenment works. So, rationalism, for a brief definition, it focused on innate reasoning, which is the concept that people knew independently of what they observed. It strongly emphasized that humans have the ability to recognize and understand the world through reason. This was first developed I, by Rene Descartes, I think. Probably. And he used his... Yeah. It's, sorry. Close enough. Like he's sick. He's I sick. Can, yeah, yeah, he has an excuse. Yeah, he, I, can, he can say it right because he's sick. Yeah, fair enough. Matt's and and I. Use his deductive reasoning to draw conclusions from general principles. Now, Tom also brought up empirical thought, which was the based on the idea that all human knowledge comes through what the five senses can observe. Some people think you're six. That's up to you. That's not me. But empiricism became prominent by Sir Francis Bacon. No, not the Bacon number. That's something different. But he used inductive reasoning to draw conclusions from specific re observations. Observations. So, the workings of natural law could be investigated by anyone, while religious teachings relied on improvable theories or hypotheses. Those are not the same thing. They get the point across. And like <laughs> thinkers they, yeah, question... The viewers understand. Yeah. yeah, just Google it if you don't understand. Yeah. Or... 
better yet, have a call in. Yeah. Oh, that oh yeah, that would make more sense. That would make yeah, more sense. Cool. Don't Google. That's our competition. Call in. Yeah, call in. We we answer. We are the enlightened. We, we are the enlightened thinkers. Back yeah, to this definitely. enlightening topic. Enlightenment thinkers questioned religious institutions arguing that human reason, not faith, was the key to improving society. Hold up. I'm going to die quick. The goal of many Enlightenment thinkers was to reduce the power of the church in society. And for a first time, they actually denounced slavery. Because they figured out, whoa, slavery's inhumane. And some of them even argued to end the, to end the use of torture for criminals and reserving capital punishment to the most cruel crimes. Not cruel. That's a absurd crimes, such as treason. As well as making prisons more humane. Philosophers, they theorized that people lived together through a social contract, an agreement to submit to the government for protection. Ah, uh, and Jonathan Locke, yes, that's a cover up clearing your throat. Jean Locke. Yeah, however he pronounced it. I don't know. Was, yeah, was, he, French. was he French or was he English? He argued, he argued that authority. Uh, no, he was English. Sure. I don't know. Just... Would you like to talk? No. Okay, no. good. <laughs> good, because the, the sick man of Europe is talking. I'm not Turkey. Frog but... chapter. The, the John Locke, the John Locke, argued that such authority came from the people of a country who retained natural rights that no government could take away. Now, remember when we talked about empiricism, I brought up Sir Francis Bacon, who might not have to do something with a Bacon number. Maxine's going to cover that. All right, so since, uh, you know, Nick's dying, I got this. Thanks, baby. Wag. <laughs> Wag. So, the British, yeah, the British empiricist. <laughs> so stop, stop. Bring in too much. All right. People such as Thomas Hobbes and John Locke believe that just as the natural world fall natural laws, laws that apply to everybody and which humans could discover and understand through observation and reason so did human society so we got people starting to think about uh natural laws and how they should fall so we got hobbes leviathan if i remember correctly leviathan's the one where the guy's sitting there with the think with the i don't know maybe not this was a while ago (laughs) but back to it in this book leviathan Hobbes creates a government that could guarantee peace and security for citizens. People like that. He argues that in a state of nature, in a society without government, humans would pursue their own survival and self-interest with no respect to the needs and rights of others. So, anarchy. People just killing each other survive. Well, not anarchy. Well, you know. People fighting and killing each other. That's not good. So, each Boo. individual's life... Yeah, don't kill each other. Each individual's life would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. You know, we'd be like in the animal kingdom. On animal planet, just we wouldn't be recording it, we'd be getting eaten because we suck at being survival. In order to form society, individuals would give up some of their rights to a sovereign authority. So this whole idea that you would have to give up a little bit, but in return you would be safe and have a longer life, and it wouldn't be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. That's good. The authority would be a powerful, similar to a great sea monster from the Bible called a Leviathan. So you need a strong central government to make sure to ensure power and keep you alive. All good things. He favored absolute monarchy on one ba- oh wait, not one based on divine right though. So strong monarch, but no God. That's probably a big, big thing. He feared that a government with limit with limits on its power could not command the respect and fear necessary to tame and control humans' natural, violent, self-seeking nature. So Thomas Hobbes thought humans were terrible, and we're literally just going to kill each other if we are given the chance 
without any, you know, anybody to rule us. So we have his counterpart, John Locke. Also, so, oh, uh, oh, uh, quick cut you off for a moment, Matson. For those who are curious, the cover of uh, Leviathan is on the uh, podcast stream right now. It's a uh, giant prince guy hovering over it appears to be a small town. He's like taller than the mountains. He has a sword. And I, I can't tell what the other thing is. Some sort of staff. He looks like it's a big man. It's a yeah. It's K. It's his scepter. The, uh... It's it's yeah. It's me in the AP Euro classroom. Yeah, <laughs> Matt's no, looking no. over his subjects of AP Euro. Looking over the peasants. Yeah, the peasants. Looking over everybody going. <laughs> looking while he's cheating off of my test. <laughs> Whoa, yeah. that's a no cheating, bro. Yeah, I don't. Uh, okay, do yeah, sure. All right, but I'll talk about John Locke, and then uh, I'll throw Tom and the French because oh, I love I'm not the doing French. That. Yeah. All right, so we got John Locke. Wait, wait. Thanks, Nick. Glad you're back. So we got John Locke. Thanks. He wrote in in his essay concerning human understanding. Locke insisted that a person's mind at birth is like a blank slate. They derived all knowledge from what they had experienced and their senses, and they are thus capable of learning and improving themselves. So this is a positive outlook. Humans aren't terrible creatures that are just meant to kill each other. We can improve and not be terrible. Locke emphasized the importance of education and creating a stable society. Smart people, smart citizens good stuff he also wrote yay yeah that's the entire reason we're talking about this right now smart citizens smart students well he students me. he came up with the ideas america is founded off of oh so just as tom was saying about that two treaties of government john locke argued that people are born with basic and inalienable rights including life liberty health and property just as tom said that's pretty important right here. No. Oh, wait, I'm not going to nah, nah, get into it. No, nah, but Locke believed that the purpose of such government was to protect people's natural right. So we have Hobbes saying that it should just keep people in order, keep people in check. Locke believed that it should protect these natural rights. These natural rights are very important. But we'll, as you see throughout history, uh, it's not going to go over so well for Locke. But or Locke's ideas, especially. But in, in general, should the government fail to uh, fail this regard, the people could replace it with a new government. Whole entire idea of I don't know, like, uh, you know, United States, pretty good ideas. Nah, unnecessary. Yeah, we don't need to protect people's rights. But then we got into the French idea, as we know. Did we talk? About, yeah, we talked about absolutism. Revolution. Yeah. Nope. Nope. Not yet. Yeah. yeah, that's what I don't get is. We're going to talk about the revolution before the Enlightenment. I don't... Whatever, whatever. Yeah, Amsco but... smart. Just, yeah, come there, Hattel. Let's Make just get into... Make a religion out of it. <laughs> That's in depressed. So this brings us to... Excuse me, the French philosophies. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going to try and pronounce that a different way every single time. So, uh, yeah. during the 18th century, us 200 IQ intellectuals popularized the new scientific attitude towards the reason, which were known as the philosophists, and they criticized France's ancient regime, which, you know, refers to its feudal social and political system, where, you know, the monarchy, church, and nobility, they controlled, <laughs> thank you for the comment, Brown, and he controlled yeah. society for, you know, all their own benefit. So all the, you know, the third estate, as we know, isn't going to get, like, any benefit under the, the feudal system. And that's what these philosophs were uh, mad about. And they saw the find a lot of mostly social reform, and they believed that natural law should govern these social institutions, similar to the way that the natural laws govern the system which the universe is under. And... They brought their task about to discern what these natural laws are for the basis of reform. And one of these, you know, the most prominent figures, arguably most prominent, is Voltaire. And according to Amsco, he was the most influential 
philosophy, and he was his real name was no, was Fran Francois Marie Arouet. Yeah, but he went by his pen name Voltaire. So Voltaire he fiercely advocated for tolerance and freedom of religious belief, and he wrote a lot of uh, satirical critiques on the French clergy and the aristocracy, which he deemed very ignorant and corrupt, as you know, we see many figures before him already doing such, like Martin Luther complaining about the uh, clergy. And he also uh, criticized religious fantasism and a lot of the superstition in Paris's most uh, famous, oh wait, I think one of my points got accidentally pushed together. Uh, so he, he criticized fantasism and superstition, but he was also locked up in Paris's most famous prison, the Bastille. For some reason, those two points got merged together. I guess I wasn't paying attention when writing notes. So, anyway, Voltaire was, uh, when he visited England, he was uh, very impressed by the English society, and during his exile from France, he wrote the letters on the English, which was a, a, British, a very bitter satire that, you know, extolled the virtues of the English while demeaning French society. He was very much against what the French were doing at the time. And he also wrote a, a short novel called uh, Candide. It was a very bitter commentary on the hope for progress. So, you can definitely say Voltaire was not an optimist. He did not see much improvement going on, or at least not enough to the point he was happy. But he did want improvement, obviously. Another one of these key prominent figures is Dennis Diderot, which Brownie's going to tell you about. So, Mr. Diderot, as I'm going to call him, because I don't like saying Dennis, <laughs> he was fascinated by the idea that everything in the natural world could be cataloged and described. Does this sound familiar? Maybe it does. But he made a 28-volume work called the Encyclopedia, which is translates to The Circle of Teachings. Diderot's Encyclopedia, I take that very nonchalantly, was controversial <laughs> by its premise because it placed human reason as the foundation of all knowledge. So it's very unbiased. So, d despite attempts at censorship, I can't speak to her. The encyclopedia was widely disseminated across Europe as well as the Americas. Now, we're going to get more into the law side of a philosophs. I said it right. I don't know a mispronunciation for it. Tom. The philosophies. That works too. Oh <laughs> Shut up, Matson. You trying to pronounce oh, words right? Yeah. Sorry. We're, I'll go back to not paying attention. I'll make a fuck of you. Yeah. So Montesquieu, he was a French lawyer and writer. He was critical of monarchs, usurpation of traditional prerogatives of a aristocracy, and in his piece of literature. On the spirit of laws, he argued that the best system of government featured a separation of powers. Does that sound familiar? No. A division of government authority into separate branches, such as the legislative, the executive, and, you guessed it, the judicial. Oh, not the Mongols? No. Darn. No. Cue the Mongol Taj. No, the goal. <laughs> We need to like now, get our own form of the Mongol talk. So, like we now to, you're like, paying. Now you're paying attention, Keith. Man, we need Go to replace the Mongols with something else, though. The Albanians. Yeah, cute Albanian Taj. People dancing around, getting <laughs> conquered by Italians. <laughs> we should actually. I'll, I'll try and make one for Thursdays. Each branch. Yeah, we're doing with the Congo. Yeah, the Congo Taj. It's just like a bunch of Belgian tanks. <laughs> no, no, the Blitzkrieg Taj. No, no. Yeah, I'm doing that the Blitzkrieg take... Taj. No, yeah, that'll be funny. Cue to Blitzkrieg. Oh, and France is conquered. 
<laughs> oh, Can oh, and our videos take off of YouTube. <laughs> now, each one of these branches, they were put in a system called, oh, wait, wait for it, checks and balances. And the ability of each branch was to limit the power of the other branch. One checked the other branch and kept a balance of power. Whoa, Treaty of Versailles. Whoa, that was the last episode. Whoa, Maxing, you guys talk about <laughs> I, don't, Zare, I, don't, I don't think the Treaty of Versailles is the same thing. Is it? Oh my no. god. <laughs> no, they don't go together. Vienna. It was Vienna, was it? Crap. No. <laughs> oh no. I, I get this mixed up. Not, one has an like, idea of balancing of power, but not for government branches. Balancing, yeah. balancing the, between the branches. The one that's balancing the powers of the nation. But... Yeah, it's still balanced the power. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Who cares? Now we got Cesar Picardia. There we go. Woohoo. Pretty sure he was Italian, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was Congress Probably. of Vienna. Yeah, I thought so. But he sparked a criminal justice reform movement where he brought scientific reasoning to bear in the field of criminal justice his influential uh, treaties on criminal... On crimes and punishment. And I should probably wipe my glasses off because they are dirty. Put your glasses back on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, there's dirty. We'll get there next year. The car called for... What? You have to clean your glasses or have a big intermission. No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> intermission? Just, uh... I heard intermission. Let's no. Like today's sponsors. We just... <laughs> we've, been, we've been doing it for 22 <laughs> minutes. The car called for an end of the use of torture. Common tactic of the time. Applied on suspects top email me to obtain uh, confessions. He argued to do that torture was irrational because it might lead to an inipper, innocent person to confess. As you would have guessed, getting tortured not good. He also downs capital punishment as not only necessary, but also a, a violation of basic rights. Oh, unnecessary. I, I'm contradicting myself once again. Unnecessary, but also violation of basic rights. The state does not have to take lives so he didn't want he wants to get rid of that uh you know killing people for being bad that's not the state's job the state's job is just to put them away for being bad as men are rational beings the punishment should be just as severe enough to outweigh the possible rewards derived from committing the crime man punishment should no should uh equal the maybe, crime maybe you should clean your glasses Oh, they, I they can read. I'm just a little more than the crime is the idea. Well, I know, but I'm, there's a saying. For, uh, there's a saying for it. I don't know. Can't but do yeah, the time don't do the crime. Yeah, something like that. But basically, <laughs> eye for an eye. Feel, or is that what you're thinking? I don't know. Just I'll just keep talking about it. I'll just okay. make up stuff as I go along. Just uh, you know, if you steal something, you know, something not that bad will happen. Kill someone, probably gonna be killed. There you go. But <laughs> it's so terrible. I'm terrible today. Bakari is considered the father of modern criminal law and father of criminal justice. Oh crap. I got this. Then I'll let Tom talk about women. Oh gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tom's got it. Yeah. Oh Juan. boy, I time for misogyny. <laughs> No, you can't help that. That was the time period. John Jacos Rousseau. Probably butchered that. I definitely should take French. Rousseau is uh, famous for his treatise, The Social Contract, which is striking assertion that a man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. Or, but ev <gasps> wait, no. everywhere he is is in chains. There you go. I probably should wash, wipe my glasses off. Who cares? Rousseau, I'm going to say his name four different times, viewed people in their natural state as free and happy. He thought people were happy when they're out in the woods hunting, fishing, being good old guys and gals. He argued that humanity entered into civil society to secure this freedom and happiness. So people are coming together to be free, happy. That's always good. The state existed to promote the liberty and equality of its citizens, and the law should respect only when they are supported by 
the general will of the people. The will of the people should support the laws so everybody's happy, free, on equal footing. We're so strongly opposed to the idea of Republican form of government. Republicans are bad, apparently. Republican forms of government are bad. Yeah, there's a difference between Republicans and a <laughs> I know, Republican. I know, it's a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke. <laughs> You're going to trigger politi- politicians. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This is the Asia reason in Europe, not America. We like Bernie and Donald Trump. I don't care well, who's the president. As long as, they, as long as you get stuff done, you can be my president. Who's American hmm. president? I don't care. You might not you want to get say stuff that, done. Matt. <laughs> Whatever. No one watches this podcast anyway. Did someone say Mao is a dog? Mao is a dog. Stop this chapter. Mao Zedong is. I don't Mao Zedong's not in the book. I don't think you sure about, are, you, are you sure about that? All right, he's probably on one page where they're like, Mao Zedong was bad in China. The Europeans could do nothing Let's about it. it. Next, Jack, Jack, Jack's still in the book. But we're checking I, index. Oh, sorry. He insisted that citizens should make laws directly, and that the ideal states would be solid enough that they assemble all citizens would be possible or that an assembly of all citizens would be possible so he wants everybody in the state to have an opinion of what's going on in the state i don't see it in the index sorry it's not in there i know it well, his book Gor- titled Gorbachev's not in the index but he's in the book so Mao Zedong may be in the book it's just a theory a guy i'm scared of theory. <laughs> I'm scared. thank you for a walk and next year they'll put in order of actual relevance yeah, and get rid of the AAB and the multiple choice. In his book titled Emily, Emil, or on education, he defined the proper role of education as fostering the innate curiosities of each child who should be regarded simply as a small adult. So instead of making that kid work in the farms, we're going to get him to read books and be like a small adult. So then when they become real adults or big adults, they, uh, you know, can be good to each other. Now, since we're done talking about men, I want to let Tom talk about women during this time period. Yeah, so prepare for misogyny with women. So there were a few Enlightenment thinkers that argued women were equal to men. But the majority believed that women were still inferior to men in many different ways. However, there were two uh, Enlightenment thinkers that broke away from this train of thought and argued for women, which were Marquise and Madame de Condorcet. Sure. In his In Marquis essay on the admission of women to the rights of citizenship, he reasoned that if the natural rights are based on the innate capacity to reason, it is logical that women possess the same natural rights. So, women should enjoy the same rights and freedoms that men enjoy. And then his wife, uh, Sophie de Condorcet, whatever, she was also an Enlightenment thinker, and she held very much similar views to her husband. And she translated the works of some other thinkers, such as Adam Smith and Thomas Paine, into French. So obviously, a lot more people uh, in France are going to be able to read Enlightenment ideas. And uh, their ideas will then spread much faster than before. And then, this goes back to however Rousseau that he argued that nature itself gave men power over women, which justified women's unequal treatment in society and their exclusion from the sphere of politics. And he ar- and Rousseau argued that the proper sphere for women were to be subservient and helpers to men. And then this brings us to one of our first, um, I guess, like feminist thinkers of the time, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft which her most famous work was the Vindication of the Rights of Women. And Wollstone, she was a self-taught woman who received little formal schooling herself, but she made a very powerful argument for better education for women, so like men, they could also cultivate their natural capacity to reason. So as we mentioned before with like the uh, creation of books 
an enlightenment thought in French, this went to the, uh, the spread of these enlightenment ideas and the uh, growth of civil society. And there were two main places that these people were to, you know, talk about their ideals and try and spread them. One of the first main ones was the coffee houses, and the other one were the salons, which both are very important institutions that spread enlightenment ideas, and very, they were both very popular in France, especially. So, a lot of time, political groups in these societies, they often formed and met in the coffee houses, However, for the most part, coffee houses were pretty much a, a male-only sphere. But French discussion groups, you know, known as the salons, they often were much more mixed gatherings. And one of the most famous saloniers, however, however you say that, was Madame Sophie de Condorcet, the one we, lady we just talked about. And then there was another way they could spread their ideas besides just talking, and that was the spread of the printed word popcorn brownie yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> you, you gonna talk about it brownie I wasn't pressing push to talk was I no no I wasn't okay so I was just talking myself great so to summarize what I just said Johannes Gutenberg made the praying press well, that did it raise literacy rate. How that affects this? Literacy rate rose more, and it, because there was a widespread demand for newspapers, periodicals, scholarly books, engravings, novels, pamphlets, and of course, the Encyclopedia, which was the best seller in its time. Conservative religious and political institutions sought to prevent the spread of ideas because they were considered radical and dangerous. Like to censor it. Voltaire's printer, he was arrested. Diderot, he desperately added pages, page proofs of the encyclopedia in order to avoid censorship. Republic of Letters, it was in letter network of letters, journals, and other publications exchanged among enlightenment thinkers and it transcended to national boundaries, thus disrupted censorship. Am I still talking? Yeah, you're talking. Yeah, okay. you're good, bud. I'm, no, I can hear you. My computer says it's offline for some reason, but I'm huh. still have Wi-Fi. Beautiful. Uh, well, we, so. we're good here. <laughs> All right. Huh. So, At least if we lose it, we'll know why. Yeah. So, books were banned in one country, and they were often smuggled in to the country from outside sources. So, this caused challenges of new cultures. Rousseau, he proposed the idea of a noble savage who lived in a joyful state of nature and yet was an unspoiled by civilizing forces, which means he had no idea of the, um, the bad side of the outside world, the um, bad people. George's, oh boy, Louis Le Clerc de Buffon. Beautiful, oh beautiful. That's pretty good. That's pretty yeah. good, Rocky. I don't want to say that again. We're going to call him. Mr. Lake Clark. He I depicted like how you the, his most middle name. He de he depicted the ignoble savage living in a backward condition, intellectually and morally inferior to the more advanced European society. Thanks to AMSCO, we're gonna make a sudden transition to changes of absolutism and mercantilism. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, AMSCO. Act of transition for you. So, brief rundown of absolutism. It, absolutism was movements in favor of limits on government power. No, that's not and what they it is. No. What? <laughs> that, what? That's not what absolutism is. That that was like what well, was happening at the time. Yeah, brief rundown of what it is doing. Yeah. 
You got it, Nick. Keep going, buddy. You're doing great. I've lost. Hold up. All right. So there's, oh there's new theories on absolutism. One of these was brought to you by the Enlightenment thinkers. They tended to agree that monarchs were entrusted with power by means of the social contract and that the state originating from the consent of the governed. I'm losing my voice. Hold up. Such thinkers believe that as long as both the ruler and the ruled follow the social contract, the government was right. Not right and left, like correct. Thank Once you, formed you, politician Brownie. I am I am a good politician. <laughs> you are Ben Shapiro. Uh yeah. Bernie's bag <laughs> down with socialism. <laughs> Don't, don't say that too loud. Matt will hear. Yeah, I go. Ooga booga. What? <laughs> Wrong, Matt. So, socialism's a caveman idea. That's true. It's under- Yeah, we live together in our huts. We it's share under- mammoth meat. It's an undeveloped so? idea. Much like caveman. Whatever. Once formed, however, <laughs> not socialism. The government's role was to secure the citizens' liberty and happiness, as well as rights derived, 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 divided, der, I don't know, derived from the actual law. Dar, 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 I sound like a lawnmower still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was derived from the actual law. You sound like a lawnmower that just went over a stick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before the formation of a government. Now, before I lose my voice, Maxim's going to talk about enlightened absolutism. Thank goodness. That lawnmower's out of the way. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Whoa, no oh. roasting on the podcast. Sorry, 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 sorry. Someone started that before me. All <laughs> right. Just a, if, you, if, you, if your friend jumps off a bridge, Maxim, would you jump off with him? I don't know. If no, I, I called him off. If I got called a caveman by some kid, would a bunch of my friends call me a caveman? Yeah. Yes, they would. Yes, they would. So, I don't know anymore. But, in <laughs> late... We abs- love you, Max. And- yeah. The kid from that school that I'm not going to name really loved me, too. No homo. No homo. Especially there. All right. So, we got an enlightened absolutism. Most philosophs ooh, advocate a new revolution, but political reform... Hey, what- Tom, he said it right. Oh, yeah, Tom. Can you say it for me? I think uh, I said it wrong. Uh, philosophies. Oh, okay. Philosophies. Okay. All right, good. Just so I know how to spell it. Many European rulers look to the... Philosophies. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> for, for fresh <laughs> ideas about how to strengthen state control and streamline bureaucracy, reform, and modernization or modern social institutions. Better manage resources and increase national prosperity. I want to have complete control, but I want the nation to be good too. Good things come from that. So these rulers compromise the enlightened absolutist or enlightened despots. There you go. Despotito. Despotitos. <laughs> Despotito. Wait, no, we'll get copyrighted by UMG. Who? All right. The Universal mu- Music Group. Hold like, on, Tom. The Philosophies. There you go. We're not hostile to enlightened absolutism, since most did not oppose monarchy, unless the monarch or, a monarch violated the social contract. I'm telling you, people like to have an absolute control because that means things were in order, but they just had to be, you know, not scumbags to the people. Scumbags is a political term that I would recommend using. So we got enlightened ru- rulers. Blah, 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 blah. Ironically, the monarchs of Britain, France, nations with most vis- with the most visible and influential public in- intellects regarded the movement with indifference or hostility. Very fancy words to say Britain, France, not on board with that. Catherine the Great of Russia, Frederick the Great of Prussia, and the Holy Roman Emperor Joseph II welcomed Enlightenment philosophies to their courts, providing financial support and embracing such forms as religious toleration, 
and an end to capital punishment. We talked about this before already. I'm not going to talk about these people again. But just so you know, they were in line rulers. Because it's going to probably be important on the test if we're going to talk about it twice. Piece of Westphalia. So, don't forget about that piece of Westphalia. Don't, don't worry. It will come back sometime during the 21st century. I'm actually we'll waiting for it to come up again. Like, I can't wait. I know. As soon as I as soon as I see it on test, I'll be like, well, man, I remember talking about that. The next I don't remember chapter what it is did. about somewhat about religion, so maybe it'll come. Oh, it's coming back up. All right. So yeah, we got enlightened rulers changing the way of life and being good, minus in Britain and France, because they ain't about that. So we got important reforms. They limited the ability of the nobles to punish the peasants, abolished certain tax exemptions for the clergy and nobility. Establish a means of legal protection of religious toleration. Work to codify laws and supported internal improvements. So we're making the country better for the people and not having this 1% clergy and nobility in France. Not in France, though, because they're not doing this. But in other countries, the clergy and nobility get away with certain stuff because they rich. The rich are going to be taxed. And so that leads to the new the challenges of new economic theories. Tom, that's a cue. Go. Good, good transition. So, what are these new uh, challengers? You know, challenger approaching is the uh, physiocrats. Flex on them. Got flex. Uh, on them. Phil Swift. <laughs> Phil Swift. Phil Swift here. They uh they argued that land and labor were sources of the wealth, and just like John Locke, they saw that government's function was to be the protection of life, liberty, and property. So some of these uh, main figures were Anne Robert Jacques Turgot, who was the advisor to King Louis XV of France. He advocated for laissez-faire, a phrase that uh, a phrase that pretty much translates to "leave alone." So it's the idea that the government should, you know, not be interfering with the economy and letting you know there be free trade and less regulation so pretty much let the economy do what the economy needs to do and then another prominent figure was Fran- Francois Quesnay he believed that a that sounds perfect <laughs> good Great. Enough for me. excellent uh, they believed that a state's economic strength you know that it derived from the gold and silver uh, sorry, not from the gold and silver, but from agriculture. And Quesne, he called for reduced taxes, eliminations of tolls, and an end to government restrictions on trade. So we want to break away from the government having this overly tight grasp on the economy, away from mercantilism, towards free trade, you know, the free market, and capitalism. And then another one of these, you know, very uh, prominent figures is Adam Smith. He uh, believed that people were naturally social, and in his book, the Inquir- An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, it marked the st- start of the modern economic thought. He, he directly attacked mercantilism for its overregulation in trade and the attempt to accumulate gold, because, you know, if you just have gold sitting around it's not really helping the economy it's just sitting there you're not like trading and building up the wealth of the nation so he also believed that you know individuals they made the choices as what to buy or sell and you know what jobs to take or leave so all this was based on primarily on their own self-interest so when everyone did so the competing self-interest balanced each other out Right, so you know, you have a guy who needs to buy farm tools to sell his, you know, his crops. He's gonna go buy farm tools from someone else, so that guy makes money, and then he goes and sells his crops, so he makes money for his own. And then, the, sorry, Adam Smith was best remembered for his attacks on the excesses of the government regulation under the theory of mercantilism. So, that pretty much wraps up this chapter, The Age of Reason. Is there anything you uh, fellows would like to add? 
Uh, mm-hmm. no. no. Oh, jeez, I'm dying. I think I what Nick got. Time for over. Um, no, just, just the lightning. The lightning's pretty important. Uh, we got some new ideas of how people think and how people act and the importance of government. And we, I mean, we already talked about absolute rulers and their enlightened absolutism, you know. So, just uh. It's a lot of thinking about, you know, how people are, how people should act, new ideas, still coming around, pretty important stuff. Yes. And I'll let Tom summarize it because he's better at that. <laughs> so I'd say the mo- there's like two prominent key points to take away. The first one being that we're going to take this idea that came about during the scientific revolution, that being the scientific method, and trying to apply it to everyday life such as, you know, government, social interactions, and, you know, economic interactions. And we're going to use things like rationalization and empiricism to actually test and figure out which ways do work the best. And we're going to have, like, tons of different modern philosophies coming up with these ideas like Voltaire, Rousseau, John Locke, and a bunch of others that I just, I'm too lazy to mention. And then... The second idea is that we're going to start seeing this shift more towards modern democracy and not like quite there, but we're like moving towards it. And we're also going to see the shift much more towards market economies. So we're going to start getting enlightened um, despots or like, you know, enlightened monarchies that are going to try to appease, you know, the peasants in the third estate by giving, you know, by removing capital punishment, removing tariffs and tolls on trading, by giving them more freedom, religious toleration. So, like I said, we're nowhere near democracy or, you know, Republican forms of government yet, but we're moving towards them. And these ideas are definitely going to spark the French Revolution, which, I mean, we already went over, so go over, go to that podcast. I don't know why the age of reason is after the French Revolution. But it is. Yeah, why not? Just just throw after it. Who cares? Order does not matter in history. Yeah, just about exactly. what happens. If you want, so, if you need to know anything, Martin Luther came after World War II. <laughs> According Basically, to Amsco, Martin Luther AMSCO, was born after World War II. But the wet the but the piece of Westphalia wasn't born for World War II. Just it's an underlying cause. We'll get there. Don't worry. Sadly, the piece of Westphalia was not mentioned in this chapter. Maybe next oh, one. It will. Let's get you mention every video. I'll make sure of it. Yeah, we'll keep. We'll mention it, even if the book doesn't. You know what we didn't mention? mention? What? What? DeLoreans. That's true. We didn't mention DeLoreans this podcast. Aren't you guys so proud of us? Well, we just gigged. So. Yeah. Ha ha ha. Get wrecked, totally. nerds. Yeah, I came back. Thank you, time. Colin. So, I believe it is call-in time. Ah ah ah. If you want uh, to do uh, a call-in, join the Discord, join the call-in waiting room, and we'll pull you up. And it looks like we have our first call-in ready. Let's move this lado up. Hello, you're on air. Oh, uh, hello. Hello. Uh, I'm calling like a loser. From, uh, oh, uh, that, that's pretty rude right there. Hello, I'm, I'm calling from the depth, from within the depths of, from of the Bastille. Ah. Oh, they yeah, locked me up for the Bastille. Uh, yeah, I, they locked me up for mispronouncing French words. Darn. So, oh. Well, I'm going to be there for a while then. Yeah. They come so, for um, you, Yeah, they're going to come for you if you go to France. Uh, the, oh, oh. Well, I've, I've got to be a little bit more quiet. French guards. Wee oui, wee, oui, of course. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um <laughs> Anyways, boys, I have to hear your honest opinion no. on these enlightened thinkers named John Locke and Hobbes. Who who was right? Who is the right person in your honest opinion? It's it's all in, it's all in the person, my dude. Someone like Machiavelli, he would have been like Thomas Hobbes was my brother, but. Me, I'm American. I'd stick to Jonathan Locke because 
I don't like King. I would have to agree uh, with that for John Locke, just because more freedom, more uh, yeah. tr less well less trade regulation and better economic freedoms. But uh, oh, we don't want to get oh, too it's... political. <laughs> but it doesn't but, matter. Uh, no I'm one's going watching. with. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm going with Hobbs though. Hobbs my kind of oh. guy. Because mm -hmm. we're talking about keeping people in order and having peace and security. Nothing nothing keeps peace and security more than just someone oppressing the people. Uh, I mean, I guess that's true. <laughs> if you can't We're beat gonna him, ensure peace by beatings. <laughs> yeah, if you're gonna speak up against the government, you're gonna get beat down. But no. I mean, in general, you got Locke and his ideas, you know, the whole entire basis of our nation. Yeah. Whatever, that's cool. The beatings will but, continue until peace is ensured. But uh, I think I think Hobbes, you know, he's just got his own like. Humans are terrible. Yeah. We are terrible. Are you, we are terrible creatures. Are you a uh, half glass empty, Matson? Uh yeah, I'm I'm realistic. That's why I don't like poems. Well, I mean, I hate poems Th too. But thank you, AP I Lit. I don't go for the oppression of people by. <laughs> A radical no. dictator government. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's an absolute monarch. Uh, same thing. <laughs> you didn't, it could Fancier be an enlightened, term. It could be an enlightened absolute monarch. Okay. Yeah. I, just, I didn't say there had to be genocide. I didn't say that. I didn't say there had to be I didn't even, I didn't say people genocide People in either. order. <laughs> <laughs> no one Whatever. mentioned I genocide care. until you did, Madsen. Well, Armenians, you know, where? Where yeah, are where, where, what, what Armenians? But uh, yeah, so more of a Hobbs kind of guy. Apparently, everybody hates me though, so I'm just gonna stop talking. No, you just like genocide. Next slide. Yeah. Yep, I like genocide. <laughs> I like. Yeah. I support <laughs> Thomas Hobbs, so I must like genocide. Uh, there's the highlight. Oh. Yeah, there's I like that. genocide. <laughs> oh. oh, Matt. Please put. Matt you have to Scott. put that in context. I can't. You can't put down <laughs> that I just say. There's no way. That won't look good. Oh, beautiful. Wait, no one watches this podcast anymore. Yeah, go and watch it. Anyway. Sorry, I'll, I'll make a good highlight for tonight. But, but I watch it. Yeah, uh, sure. We got um, the casual slayer. The, that that weirdo <laughs> in the Bastille. The, the guy locked up in Bastille for not pronouncing French words correctly. So, do you have any other questions? Uh... <laughs> No in French. Uh, we oui, we oui. <laughs> baguette. Yeah. We appreciate the call. Yeah. All right. Well, since there's no other uh, call, it looks like we'll be wrapping up here. Time to thank our sponsors. None. If you want to be a sponsor and get shoutouts and free stuff, contact us. And next time, we'll be going over chapter 11 in the Emsco book, Religion, Art, and Sentiment. So I really hope the piece to West Valley is mentioned. I'll be very disappointed if it's not. So, Brownie, you want to do our little uh, outro? Yeah, because everyone misses my voice. That's true. Um, make sure to hit the subscribe button, like, bell button, join the Discord, follow us on Instagram. I'm missing something. Google Plus. Oh, yeah, Google Plus. I was about to say Google Plus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm still missing something. Yeah, hit the bell button again. More notifications. And as always, thanks for watching. Warm Water Records. Otto von Bismarck. Looks like there's some German states out there that need to be unified. Blood and Iron. More like blood and bars. Y'all listen to this. I'm the Iron Chancellor, and I feel an obligation. Unify the German states under Prussian domination. A conservative at heart, but I've got a little trick. It's the politics of power. Call it real politics. An alliance with the liberals Cause I'm industry emphatic And they're secular They like my culture Cough against the Catholics Ban the social democrats Cause I'm gonna put it bluntly That Germany will never be a 
Socialist country. I've got old age pensions and some accident insurance. If you're hurting work, I've got your back. You have my reassurance. Call it state socialism. All the liberals gonna hate. But without the working classes, we can't unify the state. The position of Russia in Germany at this hour will not be determined by its liberalism, but its power. Great questions are decided by speeches or majorities. It's blood and iron. I'll use war to spread authority. With the Austrians as allies, we took Schleswig and Holstein, then declared war on Austria, the next step in my grand design. Russia won in seven weeks. Austria wasn't any match. Then it's time to provoke France with the M's dispatch. Funky led a modern army armed with telegraphs and trains. France decisively defeated, gave up Alsace and Lorraine. After unifying Germany, then I really had some clout. Now it's 1890 and I... I'm out.